every year, and they break it into nine chunks. And they say, okay, this is September 1st to October 15th. And then they pick a characteristic week, just arbitrarily pick the first week, and then they optimize that. If they tried to optimize everything, the problem would be too large and it would become unsolvable in the finite amount of time. So they decomposed it into a, a characteristic week, and they optimized that one week, and then they basically extrapolate that for the, for the rest of, of that period. So they generally solve the problem one week at a time, and then basically copy and paste that information for a specific period. Ideally, they should be able, the goal is to solve the problem for every single day, but we're just not there yet. Do you do crew scheduling as well? Um, not yet, but it is in our horizon. Yes, it's in the pipeline. Yeah, yes. We have experience working uh, in the crew area as well, for a different area. Right? Yes. Not, not, not airline like this, yeah. And just a reference point, so most of these are, so all of these are planning tools. So this, these are used to create the schedule and then publish it at least six months out. And then Skyworks is one that's more closer in, as you, as airlines sometimes have to make changes as you get closer to the date of operation. Okay. All right. Yes. It's rather technical question, but I'm wondering uh, how, how it works. I mean, uh, where the actual optimization, the calculation happens? Is it a remote server or? Where, where is this optimizing? Yeah, so yeah, so our architecture is we actually have uh, we have computational nodes that actually do all of the computations. And then um, I don't want to say completely thin client, but we have like a, a hybrid between thin and thick client um, and a dedicated app server for the user interaction. So the application is a web-based application, but it's desktop. Um, and all the computations are done in remote what we call them computational nodes, which can be scaled up or down based off um, the needs of the airline. Right. Okay. I will hand it over to Sapone. We'll walk you through the real case study. Thank you. So I hope everyone enjoyed Chairman's speech. Now it's a boring time. <laughs> Interesting about real world is that it is much, much, much older than airlines. The industry itself was long, long time ago. You're telling the first time that people have something very close to railroad is like in 1500s when you actually have a horse pulling a carriage, and actually you still have semi track to actually let them track uh, pulling the, your goods over the trail. So it's still much better than using human or just pure horses. But things have been changed so much, especially in 1800, when you actually have a steam engine. Right? Everyone have seen the steam engine? Like, oh, not this guy, this guy is too advanced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, does that actually revolutionize of exporting goods across the state, across the country, with the real roads? Let me show some more beautiful picture from our graphic design. Uh, so, before we go into this, you know trains. People say train, train, trains all the time, but what actually train? Train the composition of, what is this? Anyone know what it's called? Locomotive. Locomotive, how did you know? <laughs> Locomotive engine. Local mean that they're from somewhere, someone who knows Spanish better than me. But motive is a cause for motion. Right? So you go from somewhere to another with some kind of engine. So that's really straightforward. Long the engines. <clears throat> and this is the four cutouts of the talk today. But let me give some brief overview. If you watch the video earlier, you see how we come so far from 2000. Actually, uh, our famous researcher, who happened to be also uh, our speaker's uh, dad, who actually is an expert also. <laughs> He's he an expert in uh, uh, network uh, optimization. And very first problem he worked with industry, actually, locomotive optimization. Why this is important? Simple, it's expensive. It's very expensive. So locomotive right now, one of them would be created. And uh, with a modern cost, would be close to two to three million dollars for the locomotives. 
But you say, yeah, this could be a very good engine, and it never fails. No, it actually fails all the time. This actually is something counter to the reality. So that's why what Shaman did for the airline makes sense. You have a plan. Airline executing plan almost 100% of the time. Railroad, yeah, 50% you're lucky. You know, most of the thing actually in the railroad was actually uh, unprecedented. So actually you don't know. In the entire network, for example, the CSX is actually our main customer. 20,000 miles or 35,000 kilometers. Half of the network was actually occupied by uh, unscheduled trains. The other half was basically scheduled. So when you have a mix of deterministic, you know how it should go in. With the un uh, indeterministic and mixed together, it actually just creates a chaos. To manage a chaos network, you cannot rely solely on the plan. And that's why we actually have uh, our, our application to solve that problem. What you see here, can you guess what it is? Well, you don't read on the top. Do you know what it is? It's a yard. So why we need yard? Yard is a place where action happens, where the terminal people try to reassemble. What is it? The group of the cars. It actually doesn't come from Google Map. So you, you zoom in, and it's actually one of the biggest yard at CSX. You see like thousands and thousands of cars actually line up in several tracks. And actually we also have an expert in the yard, also <coughs> simulation. This is a type of the yard called hum yard. There are two types of yard for, for the real world. One is a hum yard, one is a flat yard. So what's the difference? Hum yard, usually the one is more efficient. How is it more efficient? Because it's using gravity. Right? You're actually pushing your cars over the hum and it gradually slide out and integrate it with other cars and making something called blocks. And then after that, you're putting uh, your locomotive in the front and pull it away. It becomes trains. <coughs> and also, uh, so we're going to talk about why, why this problem is, is important. So U.S. class one, or basically the top, top uh, in the industry uh, in U.S. Each one have between 4,000 locomotives to 8,000 locomotives. So you can see how much money they're spending. They're not, they're not actually afraid to spend. Uh, they spend maybe two, three years to replace about 10% of locomotives. So $2 billion for them is nothing. But because of their thinking process, right, in the past, they said, hey, this is also part of the capital they have to spend all the time. But we want to share their mindset. Because if they can just save what Chairman saving for the airline, 10%, let's say, every year, right? We, we save it closer to what he did, at least one or two million per day, right? And that is a lot, a lot of money. And this is interesting when we look at this. It actually, in just operating cost, 30% actually based on locomotives, right? It basically, uh, the, the most important moving part of the real world is locomotives, and including also fuel. But this is the last one that's most interesting, is that for all the locomotives they have, only 50% have been used all the time. And you will say, why? Why they spend so much money and already is half, half of the time? Does anyone want to guess? Repair? Repair. 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 Yes, but that's Waiting. one of the problems. Repair. Waiting. Waiting? Yes. <coughs> waiting. Waiting, yes. Waiting. So waiting for something to happen, right? Yes. And another interesting thing is that, did you guess? Yeah, number of rules, number of rules, number of tracks. Number of, number of tracks. tracks. Number Limited of your movement of the locomotives. Yeah, I mean number of trips you need, you need to continue. Okay, so you said you don't have a lot of number of trips. That's why some of them. Inventory numbers. Yes, yes. So I think all this is, is, is part of the problem. But interestingly, why is only 50% 50, 50 have been used? Because they don't know where the locomotive is. Why is that? So why? And I ask the same question, why? Uh, the thing is that, look, you have to remember that railroad actually have a really long history, running for 100 and 100 of years. They're running through mainframe system. A lot of locomotives actually weren't equipped with the GPS. So when they move around the yard and location, you pretty much don't know. Sometimes you rely on people to call, sometimes people just hiding. And hiding locomotive is real. Why do you want to hide a locomotive? This actually, I think we have to guess, but I still it's fun to guess. You know, like, 
Basically, each one getting their bonus based on on time departure. You want your train to always depart on time, right? So what is the easiest solution to do? You are always holding your locomotives at your location. <laughs> you never be short of the locomotives. Therefore, I fifty percent, right? Network can cause an imbalance, and you know demand supply just like what he did for the passenger demand and supply. Same thing here, along the network, about 20,000 miles, or 35,000 kilometers. Sometimes it's more on the east, east coast, sometimes it's on the west coast, so imbalance is happening all the time. To make sure you counter the imbalance, in general they're using repositioning, right? So basically you create a plan to move locomotive against the de ahead of the time of the demand, of imbalance. But if you don't know the prediction and everything, so you just hold it. You just keep it as much as you can. So this is really not technical at all, we're just thinking through human minds. Okay, so what we try to solve, this is uh, the product that we, we just started uh, with um, uh, cooperation with our partner. We want to optimize the assignment <coughs> and positioning. So assignment is nothing that, nothing besides that you just put locomotives, the right locomotive to the right trains. And I'm going to explain more later. And repositioning, repositioning means that you're moving from the location that actually have surplus to the one that actually need, need it. So short, shorter locomotives. Right? And basically, there's a lot of things happening in the real world all the time. Sometimes we delay, sometimes locomotive broke down and everything. We want actually a locomotive manager who manage the movement assignment of locomotives to actually just focus on exception management. What is exception management mean that thing doesn't go the way you think it would be. Right? And basically, we want to integrate this closely to operation. So you see, what we're trying to do is to help people in the field. We want them to do the right things at the right time. Right? What Chapman created is creating an excellent plan that the people in the field can execute it. This one is to help people in the field, closer to the people who actually do this every day. So if we're doing something, suggesting something that people cannot execute, you're going to create a havoc right away. And it's always Chain thing, chain in second by second. So, improve on time departure and improve local utilization. Actually, this is the biggest one. So, this is improve on time 